Hi, my name is Dr. Robert Kane, and today I'll be talking to you about applications of breast thermography and holistic breast treatment. I'm a practicing thermographer in Redwood City, California, and I interpret many breast thermograms. So let's talk about holistic breast health treatment and exactly what we mean by that term. When we're talking about holistic care, we're talking about a complementary approach. This is not an alternative. So in no way are we suggesting that this is a replacement for standard medical care, especially in the breast health arena. We're looking at the use of diet, lifestyle, and supplements to improve breast health and to lower risk. It's never a replacement for medical screening, diagnosis, or treatment. Breast cancer statistics. About one in eight women 12% will develop invasive breast cancer over the course of her lifetime. In 2020, an estimated 276,000 women will develop new cases of, invest of invasive breast cancer in the U.S., as along with 48,000 new cases of non-invasive cancer, which is cancer in situ, a risk factor for developing cancer in the future. About 42,000 women in the U.S. are expected to die in 2020 from breast cancer. Now, death rates have been steady in the U.S. for women under 50 since 2007 and have continued to drop in women over 50. So what puts a woman at risk for breast cancer? Well, a woman's risk nearly doubles if she's had a first-degree relative, that's a mother, sister, or daughter, who's been diagnosed with breast cancer. About five to 10% of breast cancers can be linked to a known gene mutation inherited from one mother's or father. So that could be a BRCA1 or a BRCA2 gene. However, about 85% of breast cancers occur in women that have no family history of breast cancer. These occur to genetic mutations that happen as a result of the aging process and life in general rather than the BRCA's, which are inherited gene mutations. Strategies to lower mortality, in other words, lower the death rates, center around mass screening, early detection, and early treatment. However, that's only one piece of the puzzle. Prevention through risk reduction is also being explored in both the traditional and holistic medical communities. Both traditional and holistic medical methods, however, have been limited in the prevention arena due to the lack of objective testing of a modifiable biomarker of risk that are specific to the breast tissue. So how do we assess risk and where do we need to go from here? Well, the, BRC, the, the BRCA gene mutation is estimated to be present in about 5 to 10% of women with breast cancer. We also use things like the Gale Breast Cancer Risk Index and the Tyra Kuzik tool. These are personal health questionnaires that can estimate risk between five and 20 years based upon genetic factors and lifestyle factors. They're generalized questionnaires looking at the historical nature of a particular patient to see what might be affecting the probability of risk. Limitations, however, are as follows. Genetic markers are non-modifiable, so they do not allow for the monitoring of an intervention. If we're going to go ahead and work with lifestyle with a particular patient, change their diet, the BRCA gene will stay the same and it will not be able to tell us if that patient is lowering their risk or raising their risk based upon the intervention. History-based indexes are a little bit better. If we stop drinking alcohol, well, then the risk rating will go down. But this is a blunt instrument because the question becomes is how much did it go down? Are we actually measuring it? In the case of the history-based indexes, we're really just using an estimation based upon statistical probability of that risk factor. So let's enter thermography, a biomarker of breast cancer risk. Now, what we mean by a biomarker is something measured 
in the patient's physiology that will allow us to see how that physiology is responding to an intervention. We can take a before reading and we can take an after reading. So breast thermography is very unique. It can establish an unusual vascular and warning pattern in the breast that are actually associated with higher risk for cancer. The patterns are an expression of breast physiology and they can change as the physiology changes, making it a breast specific biomarker. Follow-up thermography can be performed as needed without concern of harmful side effects. Thermography simply measures the infrared energy coming from the body because heat is discharged in the form of infrared energy. It does not put any ionizing radiation or anything into the body itself. It simply measures what comes off of it. So the test itself is free of any sort of harmful side effects. The question becomes, what type of literature support do we have to use breast thermography in this capacity? Well, if we look into the older literature, where many of this stuff was really researched, it starts off with Dodd, who put an article in the Cancer Journal in 1969. Anecdotally, he was reporting that many women that he was seeing that had high risk or abnormal thermal patterns in the breast tissue went on to develop breast cancer within five years. So these are what we call isolated abnormals or isolated high risk. That means the thermal image is showing us alterations in physiology that could suggest the presence of breast cancer or future risk for breast cancer. In this case, Dodd was expecting to actually see the breast cancer. When he didn't see it, initially this was called a false positive. But upon further evaluation and upon further studies, three years, four years, five years down the road, he found those false positives converted into true positives. Guthrie and Gross in 1980 also submitted to the Cancer Journal in a study called Breast Thermography and Cancer Risk Prediction. He followed 1,500 women for 12 years. And what he found was very interesting. 38% of women that had isolated high-risk thermograms and no other sign of cancer went ahead and turned into true cancer within 12 years. Now, 44% of women that had benign mastopathy, some sort of fibrocystic lesion, some sort of benign mastopathy going on in the breast tissue, not a complete normal, but certainly not an abnormal, that had a high-risk thermogram. These are women that also had normal mammograms, normal physical breast examinations. They went ahead and developed into true cancer 44% of the time. These were big statistics with very large sample studies. A smaller version of this study was submitted in 1981 in long-term assessment of breast health by thermal imaging. 137 women were watched over a period of five years. And what he noticed was 33% of the normal group, no mastopathy whatsoever, went ahead and developed into cancer within those five years. 41% in the benign mastopathy group went ahead and converted into cancer within that time frame. Now, it's interesting to note that 41%, excuse me, what's interesting to note is that women that did not convert also excuse me, women that converted did not improve or resolve. So these are high-risk thermograms that went unchanged or got worse. They did not get better and go down to a lower risk rating. The non-converters all resolved within two years to a more lower risk, more normal state of breast physiology. In Almaric in biomedical thermology, was a, which was a compilation of many thermographic studies over the years, followed 72 patients with a one to eight year follow-up with isolated thermographic abnormalities. His conclusion was thermography was the highest risk marker for future development of breast cancer. Spitalier in thermal assessment of breast health looked at 1,400 patients over five years. He saw a 26% conversion rate. 
criticism of the data really came in the form of a radiology criticism with Dr. Sickles. And this interaction was documented in biomedical thermology. There was a question answer round table discussion and Dr. Sickle presented a paper just prior to the round table dis discussion talking about his criticism of the data. His biggest criticism of the data was that these were all pro, excuse me, retrospective studies. There was no randomization, there was no control. This was simply looking at people that came in. He would have preferred a prospective study, which is considered more of the gold standard back then as it is now. As the discussion evolved, doctors that not only worked on this paper, but other doctors posed the question that while we understand the nature of why a prospective study would be desirable in this situation, did he really feel that without the prospective study that these other studies were invalid? Given the large population, the large sample sizes, and also the extensive follow-up up to 12 years. Dr. Sickle in this interaction confirmed that while he was interested in having the prospective studies, it was more so to gain additional credibility with radiologists that were more skeptical and wanted a higher level of data. He agreed, however, that the information was actionable and indeed compelling that doctors should be willing to work with this data right now to see if they could do a better job in terms of identifying risk. So let's talk about breast thermography and monitoring those physiological responses to holistic treatment. When we're talking holistic treatment, again, this is complementary. So this is happening while medical management is going on. If somebody comes in with a high-risk thermogram, they are sent for medical follow-up to make sure that cancer is not present right now. This is very important because often holistic care gets categorized with alternative care, where people are positioning one or the other. We either do medicine or we do something holistic. What we're talking about for the purposes of these studies is a joint effort. We use the medical diagnostic procedures using trained medical specialists that work with the breasts, and then the holistic practitioners are working within those parameters to affect lifestyle, diet, and nutrition in order to change the physiology and attempt to lower risk when appropriate. The modifiable risk factors include dietary status, exercise status, tobacco alcohol usage, optimizing weight, and mitigating exogenous estrogen and progestins. That's birth control pills or hormone replacement therapy. Holistic treatment takes this to the next step. It also looks at the effect of reducing inflammation on the overall risk, improving immune response to be able to, for the body's natural ability to fight cancer at the cellular level and also optimize female hormone balance and metabolism, since the metabolism and the balance could also pose a risk factor. So let's look at some case studies. This is a 39-year-old female. If we look at the initial study, we're looking at a fairly vascular breast, but we could certainly see much more vasculature happening here on the right breast. If we go to the color images, we can see it's quite a bit warmer, and the areas included include the nipple and areola. The nipple is 1.8 degrees Celsius, and based upon our reference ranges, that exceeds it. That's also true with the areola at 2.2 degrees Celsius and the inferior medial quadrant vascularity that's noted at 2.2 degrees Celsius. Here's that vascularity that we're looking at, and we can see the green warm versus the blue cold. Now, after intervention, this was a six-month diet and weight loss intervention, the patient started to show normalization of these values. If we look at it here, we're still seeing a fair amount of vasculature when compared to the right, to the left side of the breast. However, we notice that a lot of these warm markings are cooler and we're seeing greater symmetry from side to side. 
our nipple temperature went from 0.8 deg from 1.8 degrees Celsius to 0.8, and the areola went from 2.2 to 1.35. These are significant changes, and in that sense, we have two major risk factors in our grading scale that will allow us to lower the risk rating. The inferior medial quadrant vasculature, while it's still present, it's still outside the normal range. However, it's approaching the upper limit of normal, which would be one degree Celsius. Our TH5 thermogram went to a TH3, and a grading system that has one as the lower risk and five as the highest risk. Case study number two is a woman that discontinued Premarin. There was a time when Premarin was being looked at in the Women's Health Initiative study, and what they were finding was exogenous estrogen with progestins could actually be a risk factor for increasing cancer risk in a woman. So she was interested in safely getting off Premarin. She was on it simply for symptomatic relief. She went to see a natural practitioner who decided to try to intervene with Chaseberry, which is a natural estrogen mimicker, but more of an adaptogen. It's a lighter effect with estrogen. What we noticed was as follows. This was the image when she was on Premarin. And when she was on Premarin, notice there's this vascular marking in the lower surface right here. She discontinues Premarin and goes on Chaseberry. Notice how that marking is fading and almost gone in this area right here. Certainly we are looking at a much healthier situation with the breast. This is a TH3 medium risk rating that's went down to a TH2. Case study number three looks at various holistic interventions. These were targeting inflammation, breast health, and hormonal balance in a period of six month intervals. The initial one that we're looking at is the starter one. Overall, it looks fairly symmetrical. However, if we look a little closer, we see we've got some lower inner quadrant vascular warming going on right here. And we do have some changes on the nipple coming in on the right side. As we go ahead and look in these six month intervals, the right nipple warming starts to fade in TH3 it's six months, and then when we go to 12 months here, we're notice noticing that both breasts are significantly cooler. We have much less vascular activity in both breasts, and the symmetry is being restored. Holistic chemo prevention is an approach that's been happening now since, oh, I see the mid 2000s, when doctors started to discover that they can alter and influence the estrogen breakdown metabolic pathway through the use of cruciferous vegetable extracts. The two most widely used are one called indole-3-carbinol and the second called diendolimethane or abbreviated simply as DIM. What we're trying to do here is that when estrogen is broken down, it can go to either the 2, 16, or 4-hydroxy form. And depending on which form it actually goes to, we could be looking at very safe, easy to metabolize metabolites, or we could be talking at ones that are frankly carcinogenic. So here's case study number one with a six month indole 3 carbonyl intervention. We can see the warm vascular markings going on in the upper outer quadrant, extending to the areola warming to the areola region, and then also we have warming of the nipple as well. We also can see something in the lower inner quadrant. It's a little harder to see on the color images than it is in the, in the uh, black and white, but this is what we have to work with with this particular study. When we go to the post images, we're looking at a much more quiet breast, less hot colors, uh, an overall cooler presentation, and while we're not seeing a, excuse me, and while we're still seeing some asymmetry going here, the temperature differences between breasts that we use in our risk rating scale have all reduced to the point where there were no more significant ones. In this case, she went from a TH5 to a TH2+, which is a lower risk situation for the breasts. 
This is another study, six months of indole 3 carbonyl uses. Notice this unusual vascular pattern by the areola. We actually have them in both breasts here. One's by this side and then the other's this torturous marking here. You can see it on the color images coming down here. But when we go to case study number two, notice how this marking is fading and nearly resolved. On the left, it's better, but not completely resolved. So the right breast actually went from a TH3 to a TH2, while the left did not change risk ratings, we're certainly seeing improvement in the overall vasculature. Case study number three is a combination approach. This is indole-3-carbonyl, DIM, and iodine in a woman with in-situ carcinoma. She was diagnosed with a high-grade DCIS at the 10 o'clock position. Her surgeons had decided to wait and watch. She had a second opinion, and everyone was in agreement that no surgical intervention was going to be approached at this time. She was looking to mobilize her body's resources to better deal with this situation because not all DCIS will go ahead and progress to cancer. When we initially started, she had the vascular warming that's sitting right above the areola and along with nipple warming as well. There's also warming right up in the outer quadrant in the area of the DCIS. If we look at the post image, the vasculature is almost gone. We still have some nipple and areola warming, but certainly it's a better situation. You can really see it on the color when she goes from the reds down to the yellows and the vascular pattern seems to be improving. While the TH rating didn't change, there is definite improvement in the inflammatory situation of the breast. Again, lowering risk. Now, can we say this DCAS will never become invasive? Of course not. That's not, the, that's not the point that we're trying to drive with this particular study. The point is, is what can we do to improve the overall health of the breast while the person is in process with medical management? So in conclusion, if we're going to take breast cancer prevention seriously, we need to recognize that current prevention strategies are limited without the ability to monitor the breast tissue itself. Thermography is showing itself to have literature support to validate its use as a biomarker of risk. And consequently, thermography has a use in the monitoring of holistic breast health treatment. I hope you found this presentation informative and I thank you very much for your time.